Hey guys, Wave Nunley here. Welcome back to our study series on what is new, quote unquote, in the Bible. In the first session, we talked about that Isaiah's new thing in Isaiah 43, verse 19. And then in preparation for what we're going to do today in Jeremiah, we did a session the last time on um, kind of a review of the nature of covenant. Because here in this next session today, we're going to be dealing with Jeremiah's new covenant concept that he introduces in chapter 31. So when Jeremiah talks about uh, a new covenant, and I know that what we usually do is we click and drag the way we use language today and in our culture and in our, our part of the world over onto the Bible. It's just normal and natural that we would do that as we're reading. But when, when Jeremiah says a new covenant, does that mean brand new, like brand spanking, jack in the box, jump out from behind the back of the door, surprise you, never thought this before, hit the reset button, never connected with anything before. Is that the kind of new that we're talking about? Well, a little over three years ago, I did a, uh, a, a lengthy series on covenant. You may be able to find it out there somewhere. Here's hoping for you. And it was entitled, Out with the Old and In with the New, but there was a huge question mark. Is that the way the Bible functions? Is that the way that God acts in human history? Uh, so what I'd like to do is go back and review some of the aspects, characteristics of covenant as it shows up in the Bible that we actually reviewed last time in our last segment on covenant particularly. So we talked about there being just one covenant really with lots of renewals, if you want to call them updates or whatever, but uh, constant covenant renewal going on in the Hebrew Bible and then on into the New Testament that all of these covenants have an aspect of eternality. They're set in stone. They're always going to be there. And so one covenant doesn't um, supersede the previous one. Rather, it simply builds on it. So these are all connected together, daisy chained together, kind of a building blocks kind of approach that God is taking in His relationship between Himself and us, His created uh, his uh, people created in His image. And so these covenants then are not going to conflict with one another. They're not competing with each other. They're actually cooperating in one building on the next. So when you get a new co a, a, the next covenant renewal, things are going to be clarified and the blessings and promises are going to be expanded. Sometimes the responsibilities as well. I'm going to see that this is ever improving, but then that's going to bring a greater responsibility on our part because as Jesus taught in Luke chapter 12, to whom much is given, like a relationship with God, restoration, renewal, this covenant agreement between us and Him, a contractual kind of agreement that He's going to keep and that hopefully we will. The greater responsibility is we have to step up to the plate and, um, and walk in this uh, greater sense of blessing and promise. And then God always keeps His covenant. He, he, he just doesn't back up. He doesn't bait and switch. He doesn't promise and then not fulfill. He keeps covenantally faithful to all of these agreements or contracts that He makes with humankind. So with that in mind, we go to Jeremiah 31, 31, the passage in question. And Jeremiah says, The days are coming, declares Yahweh, when I will make a new covenant. And I've put some extra Bible passages down here for you to study on your own if you want to go deeper into this. It's simply showing that this idea of new covenant, even the language that is used by Jeremiah, is borrowed extensively throughout the New Testament, including when Jesus is renewing the covenant at the Last Supper, the subject of our next segment. And Jesus talks about the blood of the covenant and the new covenant in my blood, which is reported by Paul as well, the new covenant in my blood. So in this matter of Jeremiah's new covenant that he's going to make, and by the way, you noticed on that previous slide that it's with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, you got to ask that question about this language 
in Jeremiah. New in what way? New like in American advertising industry, way, new way, or in the way that we have seen as revealed in all of the stuff that we've gone through in the previous two segments, especially the one on covenant, is new simply to renew. Well, in Jeremiah we saw that it's going to be with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. So the agreement is between the same God and the same people. As we continue to read in Jeremiah chapter 31, it's going to be uh, a, a, a covenant, a relationship that's going to bring Israel and Judah back into their same land. So the land promise is the same. The res restoration of God's blessing, God's presence, um, those are all going to be the, it, the same. So the question then is, is it new or renewed? And so I'd like for you to keep several points in mind as we work through our material in the next few minutes. One is that in the book of Ecclesiastes, we are told that there is nothing new under the sun. And in reality, if you think about it in our day, all of the hype and all of the money and effort that uh, is gone to in the advertising industry, the television, radio, etc., uh, newsprint media uh, industry, the attempt is to bait us into thinking that we've got something brand new on our hands when in reality, m most oftentimes you're working with the same uh, kinds of chemical elements, you're working the, with the same kind of stuff, but you're improving the technology or you're improving the performance of the uh, clothes washing detergent or whatever. So when the Bible says there is nothing new under the sun, basically that's kind of giving us God's opinion on His created order, His position, His perspective on. So, don't expect a whole lot of brand new jack-in-the-box stuff. You might be faked off by some of the advertising, but in reality, you're simply dealing with upgraded, improved, etc., stuff that we have had for quite a while. Uh, also, on the immutability of God and His Word, and when we use that word immutable, we're talking about unchanging. We've already talked about passages like Malachi 3.6, I am Yahweh, I don't change. We've, we've talked about um, uh, Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So God is not changing. Everything else in our world is changing, but God is not. And then because His Word is an expression, an outgrowth of His character, God's Word doesn't change either. You get in Isaiah 40. Uh, the grass withers and the flower fades. All flesh is grass, talking about us but the Word of God stays the same forever. Or, if you want in uh, Jesus' words, my words will never pass away, or not a jot or a tittle will pass away from the law. Even if heaven and earth pass away, not a jot or a tittle will pass away. Keep those in mind. And then another is the, um, the covenant loyalty, the Hebrew chesed, the chesed of God. God's covenant loyalty according to the same writer that we are studying today, Jeremiah 31, 31, the same author writing Lamentation says the covenant loyalty of Yahweh never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. So you've got these unchangeable things, the nature of God, the nature of His Word, and specifically this business of chesed or covenant loyalty. Those are locked in. They will always be there. So keep that in mind, factor that in as we're looking at this language of new in Jeremiah. Now, back to Jeremiah chapter 31, uh, verse 31. Before we even get there, Jeremiah is already setting the stage for chapter 31. He does it back in chapter 11 where he talks about the people of Israel have turned back to the iniquities of their ancestors. They wouldn't hear God's word, wouldn't receive His reproof, His direction, guidance, would not uh, obey Him, and they went after other gods, and they, Judah and Israel, have broken my covenant. Notice that it's us, it's people on this side of the covenant. God didn't break it. He didn't annul the covenant. He says that the covenant has suffered injury because of the disobedience of His people to the stipulations of the covenant. Does God have the ability, though, 
to restore His covenant to its pristine place and to even expand it, improve on it, move His plan forward. Does He have the ability to restore His people? And we're going to see in the uh, book of Jeremiah in chapter 31, He absolutely has that ability. And so even though we might on our end come up short, God has this ability to fix things that we break. Thank God for that. That's a part of the good news, including things like sin and then forgiveness and restoration and reconciliation. God can do what we can't. So, to Jeremiah 31, and now we go verse by verse. The days are coming, declares Yahweh, when I'm going to make a new covenant, and that's the whole, the whole question surrounds this word, chadash. Um, is it brand new, never seen before, disconnected with everything that went before that? Or is this some kind of a, a, a covenant fix, a renewal of a previously existing covenant? And he says, I'm going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. So the, the people, the, the participants in the covenant, God, Israel, Judah, those haven't changed at all. So the question has to be asked. I know that it's a rhetorical question, but we've got to go there. Is it really all that new when the same participants in signatories on this covenant are exactly the same as uh, were in place in, the, in previous covenants or versions of the covenant? Verse 32, we're continuing in our verse by verse uh, study of uh, Jeremiah 31. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand uh, out of the land of Egypt. Notice this reference back to the previous faithful acts of God in accordance with covenant, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, then with Moses in Egypt and Aaron and the Exodus coming out of Egypt that God made promises. He made an agreement and He fulfilled His end of the agreement. So it's not like that in which way? It's, it's not going to be like this covenant because of this. Because they broke that covenant. This covenant is going to be one that's going to have certain aspects in place that are going to improve the likelihood that the covenant will be kept. Not by God, it's the, that's an unchangeable, but by us on our end. God's going to do some sort of a restorative act that, that's going to work on the insides of us and going to make us more capable of observing, uh, keeping, honoring, uh, the covenant that He's going to make, this restoration covenant. My covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them. By the way, that goes back to the book of Deuteronomy, or Devarim, in the, in the Torah, in the Law of Moses. He's referring to this relationship that He has had all along with the people of Israel. Continuing on, next verse, in verse 33. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares Yahweh. I will put my law within them. We're talking about now an internalized Torah. Not base touching. And not one of these, you know, I checked that box. Um, yeah, I, I offered that sacrifice. I observed that festival or whatever. I'm going to put my law within them. On their heart I will write it. And there we have a beautiful poetic parallelism in Hebrew, one informing our understanding of the other line. I'll put my law within them. On their heart I will write it. It will be, in this covenant, a heart matter. Um, not simple window dressing, externals kinds of stuff. And I will be their God and they will be my people. That's the promise of God's presence with His with His covenant people. But we've got, again got to go back to this question, Jeremiah's new covenant. Is this actually something that's brand new? This idea of internalizing God's Word. Uh, not just written on the doorposts, it, not just written in Torah scrolls, but actually on the hearts of the people. Is that new? And so is it new or is it renewed? Is it, in a sense, upgraded, expanded, uh, improved, uh, even like added to additional promises and blessings and, and um, possibilities? So in verse, uh, and, and the next question is, 
Dis, is it disconnected from previous covenants? See, I know that these are rhetorical questions, but they are super important because it gets right down to the nature of God. Does He change or does He keep His promises? It has, has to do with God's Word. Is, is that kind of, kind of uh, flipping and flopping all over the place based on uh, convenience? And I, I think if we answer these, yes, rhetorical questions, correctly, then maybe we will stand a better chance at positioning ourselves to better understand what God's trying to say in, in His Word. So, is it disconnected from prior covenant or covenants, or is it building upon them? I'm obviously suggesting the latter in both cases. It's not brand new. It's renewed, upgraded, expanded, improved, etc. But this is a building blocks kind of approach from Adam all the way through to the new Adam and the new heavens and new earth. Disconnected? No. Building upon, rather. A building blocks kind of approach. So God is not bouncing all over the place. Something different every day. Something brand new that freaks us out or surprises us uh, each day. But we can trust God's hand because God works in covenantally consistent ways with us. So the question is about this business of internalizing the Torah. I want to reflect back on Jeremiah's Bible. He has the Hebrew Bible, or at least a, a prototype, a version of it, and it includes the Law of Moses or the Torah. And so in Deuteronomy chapter 4, we have a, a, a God speaking through Moses, and He's talking about the whole Torah, and He says that you need to keep your soul. Oh, well, that sounds a whole lot more like real concern, internalized reality, rather than just external conformity, base touching, box checking. Lest they depart from your heart. Notice the soul and heart, heart and soul. These are similar, almost basically overlapping words um, in the Hebrew um, uh, mindset. And so, this is already in Deuteronomy 4, in the Torah of Moses. When we're talking about the law, the law itself or the Torah itself is talking about it being internalized. The whole law, in your keep your soul diligently, lest you depart, they depart, these words of Torah depart from your heart. So already there's this idea of internalization. In Deuteronomy 6, we call, this is a part of the, uh, the prayer that is called the Shema. It's prayed by observant Jews three times a day. It's memorized. It, it, everyone knows this like they know their middle name or the, their social security number. They know this, the, uh, this prayer. Love the Lord your God with all of, and here's this language of internalization, with all of your heart and with all of your soul, with all of your might. These words will be on your heart. Well, we not only get this in Deuteronomy 6, we also get this in Deuteronomy 13, as well as elsewhere, the heart and the soul. Example, Deuteronomy chapter 10. What does the Lord your God require of you? Fear Him, walk in His ways, love Him, serve Him and do this with all of your heart and with all of your soul. The, the, the language is repeated over and over, not only in Deuteronomy 10, but if you'd like to do a, a longer study, uh, make this part of your personal daily study or devotion, tons of passages right there in the book of Deuteronomy that use the same kind of language. Now, question, why is it that I go to the trouble of listing all of these Bible passages why am I constantly putting up their references in the Dead Sea Scrolls or the New Testament or the Intertestamental Apocrypha or the rabbis or whatever? It's because here we cite our sources. I am not the, the source of truth. Um, I'm trying to reflect ancient reality for you. Uh, that doesn't happen in all Bible teaching, unfortunately. But that's what we feel that God has placed on our heart to put the data before you and let you make your own decision. Are we right or not? But we're not pulling rabbits out of hats here. We are demonstrating the sources behind the conclusions that we come to. So if you're ever wondering why all the extra data and stuff, we're just wanting to be a blessing to you, to equip you, to give you the opportunity to interact with the material on your own. Um, and not uh, 
position me or anyone else involved in this um, as the sole authority and you've got to come to me or you're never going to get to the truth. The truth is out there, no doubt about it, and it's in the data, it's in the evidence. So we will always cite our sources. That's the reason for the extra stuff. So in this extra stuff, love God with all of you, serve Him with all of your heart and soul. And we have this continuing, this is still Deuteronomy 10. So then circumcise your heart, we're hearing in Deuteronomy chapter 10. By the way, another reference, we get the same language in chapter 30. So twice in the book of Deuteronomy, it's talking about a heart uh, condition. It's about, uh, it's, it's about an operation on the heart. It's the change of the heart. It's about internal transformation, folks. Nothing less than that. Circumcise then your heart. This is not language new in the New Testament. This is language that goes back to the beginning of the Hebrew Bible with Moses writing these first five books of Torah. Circumcise your heart twice in Deuteronomy. And then in chapter 11, we get this kind of language. Impress the sumptim, these words of mine, on your heart and on your soul which is almost word for word, the, the words are synonymous that are different, samtim and natati, I will put my law within them. Okay, so heart and soul, and then within them, it's bikirbam, um, is in, into your inward parts, is the way that King James reads on this, and they're actually right. It's internalizing, into, I will put my law into their internal parts and on their heart I will write it. This kind of language about internalized Torah, the internalizing of God's Word, goes all the way back to the beginning. That's pretty neat continuity uh, in my position. So back to Jer Jeremiah chapter 31, and now we're at verse 34. In verse 34 of Jeremiah, it says, And they shall not teach again, each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. Uh, rather, in this update, in, in, in this 2.0, if you want to call it that, in, in this revision, in, in this restoration and improvement of covenant between God and people, They'll all know me. You don't have to go through the priest to get to truth, to get to God. Don't have to go through a king. Don't have to go through a prophet or whatever. You know, there are a lot of people in our world today who still think that. Got to go to church to get to God. I, I've, I've got to go to um, this specific uh, expert to get uh, to God. I've got to go to this revival to sense the presence of God. That's not the way God has ever rolled. God has always been available 24-7, 365 to us. To those who diligently seek Him, God is delighted to reveal Himself and to warm us with the joy of His presence. They will all know me. So here's another, the next question. Is this brand new? Oh, this whole idea of, of, of uh, personal responsibility. Well, with Jeremiah, he's certainly emphasizing that it's not just a nationalistic relationship with God. It's not tribal. It's not just with the clan. It's not just through the temple. It isn't just through the priesthood. It's not just through the, uh, the, the uh, guild of prophets or whatever. But what Jeremiah is saying is in this covenant, God is going to so work on the human heart that He is going to make a place that is ready for Him to abide in us. It's a, a greater sense of intimacy, but it's also a greater sense of responsibility. Remember that, what Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, to whom much is given, much is to be expected. Well, that's, this is a part of that. As God moves His plan along, as He does His building blocks approach, as He renews and restores and expands His covenant relationship with, with Him, then yes, He will expect that there will be more to it on our end. So they'll all know the Lord. Won't need somebody else to lead them and guide them by the hand, but they will have this intuition, God is moving in this direction. I have God's Word. I have the guidance of God's Spirit. And between those two, I am following God in a personal relationship. And this is grounded in the Torah. It's also grounded 
e even more so, even more strongly in these words of Jeremiah about this, quote, new covenant. So this is the way that he wraps up his discussion of his presentation of this idea of a, quote, new covenant. covenant. Um, and he, he says in the same chapter, just a few verses later, he says, and this is a rhetorical statement by the prophet. The prophet says, If this fixed order of day and night departs from before me, declares Yahweh, then the offspring of Israel will cease from being a nation before me forever. Has that happened? Well, actually, no, it hasn't. In fact, Paul goes into great detail on how this hasn't and won't happen in Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11. A great study um, when you've uh, got the time and when you're ready for that. Romans 9 through 11, um, three chapters on this whole issue of the place of national or ethnic Israel in God's plan for a uh, bigger plan for the world. He says, if day and night can stop existing, then, then so can this nation. Well, so far so good on that day and night thing because the sun came up this morning and it's going to go down this evening um, and has since the days of Jeremiah. So the response to this rhetorical statement is, well, I guess if day and night haven't disappeared, so also God's covenant with His people is not going to disappear. He doubles down on it uh, and just a couple of verses later. If you can break my covenant for the day and my covenant for the night. Notice how now he's integrating this language of covenant into day and night. So that night and day will not come at their appointed time, then my covenant may also be broken with David my servant. Okay, so he's talking about regular people and now he's talking about leadership. But basically, he's making the same point. As long as day and night are in place, this covenant is going to stay in place. Hope that you see that, and, and by the way, he's not talking about new covenant here. He's just using the language of covenant, covenant, covenant. And he's talking about when I make an agreement with people, it's as sure as the sun coming up in the morning and the sun going down at night. That is God's statement through this prophet who is the one who introduced this language of new covenant covenant. He says a couple of verses later, if my covenant for the day and night don't stand and the fixed patterns of heaven and I, I, that, that I've not and I haven't established those, then I would reject the descendants of Jacob. Notice the covenant name. And David, who God has made a covenant with David. And um, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's going back to that old covenantal language, the covenant that God made with the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Rather, Jeremiah says, I will restore their fortunes. Notice that word, restore. It's not, I'm going to start all over again. I'm going to scrap all of that as plan A and I'm going to plan B. You know, I'm done with that, you know, and I'm done with them and I'm done with that place and I'm done with those words and stuff and they are no longer relevant. Now I'm going to start some whole brand new thing from scratch. That's not what Jeremiah is saying. It's the same passage, same guy, same passage. And he says, I'm going to restore their fortunes. This means not starting from scratch, but renewing, renewing. And so in your life, guys, God, every time that you mess up, sin, break fellowship with God, disobey or whatever, when, when you come back and you say, God, I, I really blew that and I'm so sorry and I apologize and I repent from that sin and I turn back toward you. Is there some brand new covenant? Is that a brand new start? Like you have to start learning all about who God is and His Word and how to you know, grow in uh, your relationship with Him? No. You pick up where you go. He picks you up where you, where you are and He restores you and you go back on the path hopefully with greater faithfulness there. That's what we're talking about in the Bible. So you can trust God. No bait and switch. No hit the reset button every so often just when it's convenient for him or he gets ticked off at you. This is a God who is pursuing you. He loves you, wants to have covenant with you, wants you then to respond in covenant faithfulness and walk in obedience to him. So let's conclude in the, this um, session, this third session in our series on new, what's new in the Bible, with this prayer again at the end of the book of Hebrews. 
Now the God of peace who brought up uh, from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant. One covenant and it's eternal. Even Jesus our Lord, may He equip you in this covenant, this, new, this improved, uh, expanded covenant, may He equip you in every good thing to do His will, working in us that which is pleasing in His sight through Jesus Christ, through, it's through Him, to whom be the glory forever and ever and ever. Amen. This is the nature of God and covenant. It is set forever. As you seek Him, God bless you in it. May you find Him and go deeper and deeper in this covenantal walk with God. Blessings to you as you represent Him in the coming days and weeks. We'll see you next time in our next segment on what's new in the Bible. God bless.